big star out of me. We'll make a film about a man who's sad and lonely. And all I gotta do is act naturally. Well, I'll bet you I'm gonna be a big star. Hello, welcome to Meet Me in the Movies. I am Noel T. Manning II. I appreciate you tuning in, hanging out with us as we talk about movies. Uh, it is officially my day off, so I did dress down a little bit. Uh, not that you cared or one, were wondering, but I did dress down a little bit. Pugsley Adams is our guest over there beside Campbell One. Pugsley, good to see you, man. <laughs> nice to be here. <laughs> How's uh, Gomez? Uh, uh, yeah, we're a little strange. I'm sorry. Morticia, I heard you guys were still doing pretty yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Wednesday and I keep in touch. Yeah, that's good, because yeah. she tried to kill you so many times when, <laughs> back when you were a kid. So good to have you. Uh, it's you know, great to be here. Yeah, Greg Tillman. That is Greg Tillman over there, side camera one. I'm tired. Are you tired? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm good, man. I'm excited. You're always perky. and Except for one time. I found a picture. Noel, I don't know if you, if you have access to it. No. You were not perky that day. The one time I, you were not really? perky. Back back in her old days of headline news. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I was. I don't I don't yeah. know what was going on. <laughs> yeah. And I probably should have fired you after that. I mean, if you, you come in and you look look like look that, like that. You know. yeah. pretty much an everyday thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Thomas, what are you doing? Well, I come by it honestly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Thomas Manning yeah. back as our guest uh, celebrating uh, Ferris Bueller. Uh, yeah, yeah. And we and you did save him. So yeah, we're taking up. Yeah. Still taking up the donations, though. They've got a lot of medical bills for y'all. So. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll do what we can to help out with that. Yeah. Thomas Manning back. Uh, we're happy, happy to have you as well. Uh, Tim Foster back on the Tim Cam. Uh, who, what is that? What is that it's behind it, man? Boba Fett? I don't know. I can't <laughs> no, tell. It's like a Power Ranger. I don't really know what that is. That is some odd stuff. Kind of like the face from uh, the, of the robot on when you lost in space. Oh, yeah. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah, and you know, the, the, the second season of that is coming back. He's got the Vulcan symbol, but he didn't look like a Vulcan. Yeah, that's not a Vulcan. I don't, I don't know what that is. Well, we, we've got a lot to talk about today. We also have Christian uh, Jessup back uh, for What's the Score. He's going to be looking at some documentaries, and uh, we're going to talk about that. You don't normally think about documentaries and music. No, you don't. But, uh, but we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later, and uh, we'll, we'll just kind of start the show off Unless you have anything you want to talk about before we dive into the reviews. Anything particular on mind? No? 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 Why am no? I still on this show? Yeah, okay. Well, we'll just we'll go on to Zombieland, the sequel. Now, uh, this is Double Tap, Zombieland. You saw the original, Just Greg, a few years ago. Just a few years ago. That was a lot of fun. It, yeah. Kind of what you thought it'd be and didn't let, down, let exactly. you down. Exactly. You know, Sam Raimi really, I think, found a way to, I'm talking about Sam Raimi because he looked oh, at okay. the Evil Dead series. Yeah. And found ways to bring in comedy and horror where it just felt like it worked. Right. And I, I think he was kind of, you know, while it had been done before him, he was the one that really, I think, perfected it. And he's going to get back into doing that same kind of thing. Now, he was not involved in this one, but I think he did have some influences on what we see with Zombieland. Oh, yes. Yeah, so this one is directed by Ruben Fleischer. Fleischer. Fleischer? Uh, so one of those, um, one huh? of those pronunciations. Ruben. So I hope you're not watching this, Ruben, but yeah. Um, I bet he's not. He's back, you know, t yeah, <laughs> he's, he's back 10 years later. He directed the one in 2009. Back for the sequel, you got the cast of Woody Harrelson, Emma Stone, Abigail Breslin, Jesse Eisenberg. They're back together, you know. They kind of came together as a motley crew in the first one, and now 10 years have passed, and they're just kind of trying to make do in zombie land, a, you know, post-apocalyptic world full of zombies, and now the zombies have started to evolve. They have uh, the uh, Hawking zombie that's like a genius zombie like Stephen Hawking. <laughs> they, have, they have the Homer, uh, Homer zombie, like Homer Simpson, who's just not the brightest in the bunch, and they basically rely on him for their entertainment. <laughs> they say, you know, you don't have YouTube, but you have a Homer zombie. Uh, but then you a have, Homer Simpson zombie, yeah. you just sold me. I'm gonna oh, see this great. tonight. It's wonderful, yeah, yeah. And then you have a T-800 zombie, which the most Terminator. Highly, yeah, yeah, most highly involved zombie, and uh, they're they're wreaking some havoc for sure. Okay. But um, so yeah, you got the core group and the cast. They haven't missed a beat. They're it's like just ten years later. They just plop right back into these yeah. roles like it's a perfect fit. And uh, also joining you have Zoe Deutsch, who is she's just so funny. Uh, she's basically the stereotypical dumb blonde in this. Right. And it's like, well, she survived the zombie apocalypse for 10 years. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> dumb blonde can do that. Okay. She, she's a steam stealer. I mean, some people might find it 
to grow a bit old just because it's that one joke over and over again. Right. But she plays it so well. It's, yeah. it's so good. Um, you also have Thomas Middleditch and uh, Luke Wilson pop up. And they're they're great as always. As he, well had as, some, he had cameos in the first yeah, one, so cameos yeah. in this one as well. Oh uh, well, if you stay for the mid credit scene, yeah, okay. I'll, I'll put that one out there. Okay. And, uh, but yeah, but also Rosario Dawson is in this one as well. And uh, this one, I'll say probably the narrative isn't quite as focused as yeah. the first one. There are maybe some little side things that pop up. You're like, ah, well, they didn't really need that. But you kind of just forget about all that because you're so entertained the entire time yeah. watching it. And, and that was the thing about the first one that I just found it was just it was just fun to watch. You could check your brain at the door, yeah. or you could check it in with the zombies. The yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and just enjoy yourself. Just yeah. kind of go along for the ride. And this yeah. one's pretty much the same. Oh, it is. Yeah. And there's uh, I would say the action is dialed up. Um, some of the action sequences are incredibly well choreographed. There's this like two minute, two three minute long just single take action sequence that's just spinning and tracking around the characters okay. for, uh, it's right about the hour, one hour mark. You'll know when you see it, yeah. but it's one of the most impressive of that type that I've seen in a long time. Okay. And uh, you know, you wouldn't expect to see something like that in a film that's, that's kind of meant to be this, uh, like an escape really. Yeah, yeah. Like you wouldn't expect it to be so artistically right. innovative, but it really was. Wow. I was really okay. impressed with things like that. Uh, same cinematographer that did the uh, cinematography for It Chapter One as well as Hotel Artemis. Okay. So uh, you'll see some pretty interesting uh, shots like Awesome, in the awesome. And you've seen this twice and so it was yeah. just as good on the second viewing as well. Oh yeah, no doubt. Yeah, I took my sister to see it last night. She, she <laughs> wanted to see it. I mean, I wasn't complaining about it. So yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what rating uh, are you going to give this? A uh, solid B. Um, okay. I mean, probably doesn't quite live up to the original, but if, you know, in regards to 10 year later sequels, right. you, those don't usually go over well. Well, this yeah. one was probably about as well as you could have asked for. Yeah. Pretty awesome. Cool. Thanks, Thomas. Yeah. Well, there's, uh, you know, Netflix is really into the movie making business. Uh, we've, we've talked about this for, for a couple of years now, and uh, last year we talked about Roma. Next week we're going to be talking about hopefully the Irishman um, and, uh, and what Netflix is kind of doing with that. But they also are finding a way to breathe new life into TV shows by creating film versions of these. And, uh, and we're seeing that Amazon's doing some of the same kind of things, Hulu as well. But uh, you got a chance to check out El Camino. You were a big Breaking Bad fan. Breaking uh, I Bad came fan. to it late. Right. But yes. But you re once you came to it, you just kind of... Oh, it's, it's it. highly addictive. Probably one of the best dramas television's produced, I think. Yeah. And you haven't seen it all, right? No, You've I've, 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 uh, I've binge watched and then I would take a break because of something else and then I'd come back to it. So I haven't watched it all the way it through. Is, I mean, it takes a little while. It's an intense series. You yeah. can't watch, I couldn't watch two or three back to back. Yeah. Uh, just because you needed that break. Yeah. You had to yeah. cleanse your palate with a big bang rerun <laughs> exactly. or something. Exactly. You know. Or, or <laughs> Zombieland. Or zo <laughs> Yeah. 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 But, uh, but here they are with a film sequel to the series. The series yeah. wrapped up several years ago, six, six, seven six years, years, years ago. Six years ago, I think. Yeah. And so uh, this one picks up right where the other one left off. Literally where the other one ended, yeah. So with that in mind, if you haven't watched right. the whole series, then you're going to be a little bit lost. Uh, yeah, you really need to see it throughout, I okay. think. It's not something uh, that you would just know what's happening. I mean, there are flashbacks that, that kind of helps you figure yeah. out where Jesse's story ended, right. started, where it's going maybe even. Um, but, yeah, it, it's, it's best to, to pick up after the, the finale right. of the series. Yeah. So, so g give me your thoughts on El Camino. If you've seen Breaking Bad, you're familiar with Aaron Paul's performance as Jesse Pinkman, arguably, I think, one of the most tragic characters ever created for television. I think he won three Emmys for it. But yeah. it, it's, a, it's a great movie. It picks up literally where the other one leaves off. As satisfying as the ending was for right. Breaking Bad, there was still some uh, fanboys that were upset because Jesse didn't get his final outcome. You didn't know where he was going. Right. And so this, was it necessary? Maybe not. Is it a worthy follow-up? Yes, it still is. Because you get, you do get some closure. Yeah. Uh, it's not a, it's not a reopening of the story. Okay. It's the final closure to, yeah. to the Breaking Bad story. So it was just, it was nice to be able to see those characters again and, and Jesus, maybe tie up a few loose yeah. And he's, on, he's, he's wonderful this. in it. Yeah. And yeah. this has got a theatrical release too, or it's going to? Yeah, it, yeah, it, it already has yeah. in selected cities. They're, they're, they're doing that now. And he would be worthy, I think, of an Oscar nomination. I wow. Mean, he really was, certainly an Emmy. Okay. 
but it, it's an extremely powerful performance. Okay. And I'm anxious to see what he does when Westworld comes back. Okay. Because you know he's in that too. Yeah. So. Yeah. So what is your uh, rating for, for uh, El Camino? And Rotten Tomatoes has it at 95%, I think, and I get that. I, I'd give it an A minus. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. El Camino. And you never watched any of the Breaking Bad, did you? I haven't, but I need yeah. to hop on the bandwagon. Uh, our, our good buddy Jeff Powell has been telling me i got to get on that. So. Yeah, and, and Jeff Powell is a huge follower of this and has been for quite a while. What did he think of it? He really loved it, and he said the only, the only drawback for him was you did have to have you did have to have the backstory of understanding the series, which is fine because this was for the fans. And he said also because it was six years later, you could tell some of the people had aged. Yeah. And some it was he said there was one character that gained a lot of weight. Todd. And he, it was a Todd. Yeah. <laughs> and he said that was a little odds considering it was taking place right after. And he right. said you know you understand that, but he said that was if you are watching it, binging it, then you pick it right back up. Like wait a minute, who is yeah. that guy? Yeah. So yeah. he said that was his. One drawback. Anything else that he said that you remember? Uh, I was going to mention that same thing as well. He said yeah. that was a bit jarring, but other than that, he he absolutely loved it. Yeah. Yeah, and I think uh, so. So Jeff, uh, I think he gave it a solid A for for Jeff Powell. So uh, another movie I want to talk about uh, before we take a uh, a break. Uh, this is a new Netflix original as well. Uh, this movie is called The Laundromat. Uh, the Laundromat is a Steven Soderbergh film, uh, and and the cast is incredible in this. Meryl Streep. Uh, Antonio Bandadas. Say that again. Antonio Bandadas. Oh, that's nice. Uh, Gary Oldman, uh, and even some cameos. Uh, David Schwimmer has a cameo, and uh, Melissa Rauch, who was Bernadette yeah. from The Big Bang Theory. Uh, it's a dark comedy. It's a social satire. It's a commentary on the financial system and really you know, people who are evading taxes and creating shell companies. It takes you all around the world and it takes you through all these different, really just a handful of characters and how one um, insurance fraud claim, well, one insurance issue affects all these people and so it's connected in that way. Soderbergh is really uh, a master of, of editing and pulling these, these pieces of stories together usually. Not necessarily the case with this one. Uh, you know I really found myself the movie is only you know an hour you know a little over an hour and a half or so um, but it, it really lacks focus and uh, some of the things I did like about it, I did like the editing, uh, I did like the characters breaking the fourth wall and looking at the camera and talking to the camera and almost narrating the story. Uh, Gary Oldman and Bandadas' character, uh, characters did that throughout uh, as they were giving you kind of these money lessons throughout and they would even throw up a, a card that was like, you know, lesson two. And so uh, I felt like I was in, in a... Uh, rush to get an MBA and try to understand the finances. Uh, I think maybe if I had an MBA, MBA I might understand some of the things that were happening a lot better. I uh, really wanted to like it, uh, but, but honestly at the 30 minute mark I kept going, okay, when is this thing going to end? Hmm. That was at 30 minutes in. You don't usually think of that uh, when you're watching Meryl Streep. No, no, and she was, you know, the, I mean, the cast did a wonderful job with what they had, but I think there was just way too much uh, going on. So, um, you know, if you're looking for a film that deals with con artists and scams and tax evasion, if you're a financial whiz, maybe you'll appreciate this more than, than I did. But uh, a C minus is really the best option. It kind of reminds me, and I can't think of the name of it, the Adam McKay film from three or four years ago. You're, there you're was a big short. The big short. The big it kind of seems like they were going for that vibe. But, yeah, but I guess so, short. but the big short worked for me. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. You know, it worked for me, uh, but this one just really, um, I mean, it has got select theaters, and it is a Netflix original film, uh, and we're, you know, we're going to be seeing more of those in the next few weeks, too, uh, as we're in award season, but C- minus is really the best that I can give for the laundromat. All right, uh, any questions or comments about that before we take a break? I don't want to see it. All right. Thomas? Uh, no, nah. I mean, it's disappointing because I know Soderbergh is a fantastic yeah. director, but it yeah. uh, yeah. looks like I'll skip this one. Yeah. I'm always right. fascinated when good directors and great actors get together and make bad movies. Yes, yeah, yeah. And, and like I said, it's for me, it just didn't work. Yeah. It just didn't work. All right, we're going to take a break. Uh, right after the break, we'll be back with uh, Christian Jessup. I, I think uh, Tim uh, does have the satellite link. Yep, he's got the satellite link yeah, worked out. There. He's got it, got it set up, and we'll come back and talk about musical scores 
for documentaries after this quick interview. We've come too far to give up. Here in Cleveland County, many children struggle to develop due to the lack of guidance and shortage of positive role models. At the Boys and Girls Club, we make it our team's mission to aid your child in becoming a better student and more importantly, a better person with a brighter future. When your child comes to the club, you can be assured they are being guided in a manner that is beneficial to the growth as an adult that is visible in their lives. Please consider giving your child the opportunity to be the absolute best they can possibly be. Please support your local Boys and Girls Club today. Listen up. Do you have a passion for cooking? A desire to learn more about the craft of professional food preparation? If so, now's a great time to check out Cleveland Community College's brand new Culinary Arts Academy. This exciting three-month program offers hands-on training for jobs in the food service industry. Across the nation, food service is one of the fastest growing industries. With your training at CCC's Culinary Arts Academy, you can compete for jobs in hotels, restaurants, conference centers, cruise ships, and other settings. Enroll in CCC's program and you'll gain in-depth training in food procedures, preparation, and commercial kitchen operations. Plus, the program includes a special add-on. You'll get your certificate in cardiopulmonary resuscitation, or CPR, training. You can earn good money, too. Depending on where you work, starting salaries range from $20,000 to $50,000. In just 12 weeks, you can be well on your way to gaining the know-how to handle food safely, properly, as a true professional. Now ask yourself, are you ready to start your journey today at CCC? Education is our most powerful tool to improve and change our world. Hi, I'm Rhonda Benfield, your host for School Matters. Join me for a new program every other week with information from and about the students and staff of Cleveland County Schools. Discover what our schools are doing to challenge students and help them reach their full potential. You can catch us on Spectrum Cable Channel 19 or stream us live on C19.tv. They're gonna put me in the movies. They're gonna make a big star out of me. Hello and welcome back to Meet Me at the Movies. Uh, hey, is our Power Ranger dancing? He likes to dance to that. He was dancing? Yeah, he was dancing. Yeah. <laughs> that is, that's just creepy. It is creepy, man. Well, it's, it's close to Halloween, so maybe that's why. Tim, is that Derek? Is that actually Derek? Is that who that is? I yeah. have, like there I can tell. Is. Yeah, all right. Good. I hope. Yeah, yeah Tim's like, no, let's pull that, pull that thing down. Yeah. <laughs> we need well, a new intern. Well, new to, oh, new intern. Ooh, ooh, hear that. All right. Uh, welcome back to Meet Me at the Movies. Uh, we do have uh, Christian Jessup, I think, uh, on the satellite link. Is that right, Tim? You got him? You got him lined up? Okay, yep. At least uh, he's looking up like the satellite. He's looking up. up. Uh, we've got a segment called Watch the Score, and uh, Christian's going to talk to us about uh, some uh, Critics' Choice nominated documentary scores, uh, and the uh, Critics' Choice Documentary Awards is coming out uh, pretty soon, and we'll be talking about that as well. But uh, let's go to Christian uh, via the satellite link and uh, get his thoughts on uh, some of these scores. How's the feed? Is it strong, Tim? Is it strong? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Huh? Yep. Love what you're doing here this week. Looks really great. What's up, everyone? My name's Christian Jessup, and I'm back on Meet Me at the Movies to do another segment of What's the Score? So I'm going to be breaking down some film scores, analyzing it, maybe pointing out some nuances that you don't always notice in film scores. And this week, I want to talk to you about something called sound palettes. What I mean by that is just like an artist works within a certain palette, they're going to use certain colors, certain brush techniques, in the same way a film composer is going to work within a sound palette. What that means for a film score is that you're going to have certain instruments that you're going to use. You're going to use them in a certain way. You're going to stick within the same genre of music. And while there's a few exceptions to this and a few exceptions that work really well, you're generally going to see that across all film scores. For example, Pirates of the Caribbean, you aren't going to see synthesizers. You aren't going to see these crazy outer space instruments or 80s synths like you would hear in a pop band. But on the other hand, Blade Runner by Vangelis, 
you're definitely going to hear those sounds because that's a part of its sound palette and it would be weird if Blade Runner all of a sudden had Pirates of the Caribbean score with those instruments with that style and it'd be kind of weird if Pirates of the Caribbean suddenly had a Vangelis Blade Runner style score. So today I want to talk about documentaries. First off, documentary scoring is really close to my heart because I've actually gotten the opportunity to score a few documentaries myself. One documentary I've had a wonderful time working on is Jim Lawrence's Galapagos Suite. It's a wonderful nature documentary going through the Galapagos Island documenting his journey there and I was able to write some music and go with a very organic sound palette. I used a lot of string instruments, some woodwinds, not very much brass, but I really just wanted to capture the natural beauty of the area of the animals and how unique it is. Listen to a clip here and you'll see how I'm using the same instruments throughout the clip. And here, even though the style, the speed, the type of music changed just a little bit, you can still hear the similar instruments and it doesn't seem like a completely different world than the music you've heard in the previous clip. That just goes to show how a film composer is able to kind of keep you within that world and build a world of sounds even though there's a variety of situations, whether it's action, drama, love, any number of situations that you come across in a film, they're still sticking within that sound palette. Let's apply that to a few scores that were actually just nominated for the Critics' Choice Documentary Awards. For example, Jeff Beale did the score for The Biggest Little Farm. The Biggest Little Farm deals with farming, landscape, nature, so Jeff Beale really went with a Midwestern type of sound, which means you're going to hear a lot of casual guitar instruments, some strings, but very casual, plucky. Like I said, it's kind of a Western style of scoring, and you can see that he sticks with that sound palette throughout the entire score, which is really cool in this type of film. Matt Morton is another composer. He got nominated for his Apollo 11 score. Apollo 11 is an amazing documentary, highly recommend it. And as you can also imagine, it's about the Apollo 11 moon landing and so the score has a lot of synthesized sounds a lot of drums obviously a moon landing takes a lot of technology and especially back in the 60s that was such a technological achievement and so he really communicates that with instruments that aren't these traditional instruments but are instead very futuristic very technologically savvy one last score i want to call out is H. Scott Salinas' score for Sea of Shadows. This score uses a lot of string instruments. Honestly, it sticks just within that string family. And it's really interesting too because you'll see really long drawn out notes that'll get louder, that'll get softer. And whenever you listen to the album as a whole and hear those crescendos, those decrescendos, the getting louder and getting softer, then you can really tell that it almost creates a wave effect, which is really an interesting choice and a good one to establish that sound palette as well. So those are just three documentary scores that you can really see the composers stuck within their sound palette and made it work effectively for the type of film that they had. Um, highly recommend you check those out. There's a few others that got nominated as well that I'm probably going to cover in future weeks. But I hope that this was really informative and next time you go and check out a film, really think about that sound palette. What instruments and what style of music is the, is the composer using that really makes you feel as if you're in the world of that film. As always, I'm gonna plug myself. Feel free to check me out on social media, Christian Jessup, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can also visit christianjessup.weebly.com. Check out some more music. Leave me some comments about how I have or haven't effectively used sound palettes in my scoring as well. And with that, I'll send it back to you guys. Christian, thanks so much. I don't really know what that whole hair comment about me was, but thank you. I deeply appreciate it. He could have uh, been referring to the picture, the old picture from the headline. <laughs> yeah, maybe that was it. Yeah, that's it. There you go. That's some good stuff, man. That's some good stuff. Well, well, me, me, the movies, uh, we do dive into all sorts of uh, movies and other crazy things as well. And Thomas is going to talk about this new movie based on another series. Yeah, yeah.
uh, and it's called Between Two Ferns. And uh, I want to get your thoughts on this one, man. So, you know, uh, Zach Galifianakis has had this long-running internet web show that's like he brings on celebrities and just interviews them and asks them the most uncomfortable questions imaginable and does everything he can with just so straight and deadpan to make them crack up. And it's, <laughs> it's one of the Stop funniest that. things you'll ever see. It's so, <laughs> it's so awkward. It's, I mean, it's 100% satire, but yeah. it's so incredibly entertaining. So the movie, Between Two Ferns, a movie, is basically a pseudo-documentary based on this satire interview show. <laughs> and there it is one of the stupidest things I've seen this year, but thank goodness it was meant to be like that. <laughs> That's a compliment. Like, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, <laughs> like, I, I was... I could not stop laughing. For, it was like an hour and 20 minutes long the entire time. I was just dying. It was so hilarious. Um, yeah, because like so much of it is just deadpan humor. It's just subtle. And it's just little facial expressions, little things that um, Zach will say or one of his guests. But there's also just some hilarious slapstick. There's some, um, there's one moment where he's interviewing Matthew McConaughey and uh, something happens. If, if you watch it, you'll know what I'm talking about, but something happens and you're just like, what in the world is going on? And um, he, yeah, you bring on everybody from McConaughey. You got Keanu Reeves, you have like Brie Larson, Tiffany Haddish, Dave Letterman pops up and um, some of the barbs and insults that <laughs> Zach, you know, that they trade with one another. It's so incredibly offensive, but you cannot help but laughing because it is just... Because the way it's delivered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the way it's delivered is yeah. so funny, yeah. And, and you were a fan of the Between the Two Ferns, the, the kind of the series. Oh, yeah, the funny, and, funny, it's on Funny or Die, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Exactly. I've been watching it for years. Yeah. 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 The one yeah. with President Obama we were talking about over the yeah. break, and yeah. Hillary Clinton are probably two of my favorites. Yeah. Yeah. And with Letterman, you were saying, yeah, you were going to definitely watch it. Oh, yeah. You, you we well, don't it. see Dave do a whole yeah. lot except his, his yeah. interview show, yeah. yeah. So, so you, what made you want to watch this? Because you never really had tuned into the other stuff. I don't know. I was, you know, was kind of have a lazy afternoon, <laughs> scrolling through Netflix, and I thought, well, I was like, this looks pretty stupid. Let's watch it and see what happens. And I'm so glad I watched it. Uh, like we were talking about um, some of the like lower third graphics. You know, you had Keanu Reeves up there. Well, it said Keanu Reeves, R E E F S, and then in like quotes it said Bill or Ted. Uh, you have things. Things like that, yeah. So um, even that visual humor yeah, that yeah. You, you, you're having to pay it's attention to. It's got that, yeah. it's that uh, public access TV kind of yeah, look. Yeah, it This is. looks like CBS, right. what we're doing compared yeah. to what he does <laughs> yeah. on yeah. his thing. And, and if you notice, the mic, we have clip-ons for your lavalier yeah. mics. They use duct tape yeah. to yeah. the mics yeah. on. So. Although I think I've done that a time or two. You do what you can, you well, know? Yeah. You do what you can. Yeah. So, other thoughts, and or, or go ahead and dive into your uh, your actual grade for it. Oh, I'm right about a solid B. I okay. mean, you take it for what it is, but as far as entertainment value, it's one of the most entertaining things I've seen all year. It's, okay. It's definitely worth your time. Yeah. Okay. Very yeah. cool. Awesome. Well, we are uh, we are about out of time. I do appreciate you tuning in, uh, spending time with us, Thomas. Thanks for your thoughts uh, today, and Greg, thanks for your thoughts on El Camino, and Christian. We appreciate uh, appreciate you taking time for the musical scores uh, as well. Tim, Derek, you guys are awesome. And uh, we're going to wrap things up with oh a gosh. movie quote of the week. This comes from Gemini Man. Uh, and if you want to know what my quote is for Gemini Man, I mean my, uh, my grade, yeah. I'll give you my grade. Uh, C plus for Gemini Man, Adam's Family a D plus. So I'll just go ahead and give you those. Wow, quick, quick we didn't get to those. But I, that's uh, Thomas gave a C, I think, to Gemini Man. Yeah. So, uh, Jim and I, man, this quote comes from Clay. The thing is, uh, this thing that you're struggling with, it's called fear. Uh, embrace it and then overcome it. So, until next time, I am creepy. No what one is man, and, <laughs> <laughs> man the second for the cast and crew right here at Meet Me in the Movies. That's a wrap.